Jesus has reached the last week of his life. He knows it, and he realizes that a fire is brewing because the crucifixion is near. We call it the Passion Week, and it's a week when Jesus is going to put the final touches on the work that his disciples are going to be called to do. The final words to the apostles are going to be spoken. He has spent his whole three years with them in ministry, trying to prepare them for what was coming, and it was a fire. The fire of the cross was going to be multiplied many times over through the sufferings and the struggles and the persecutions that would be faced by the disciples. There were some of them who had been called to die. They just didn't know it yet. There were others who had been called to live long lives in which they would be witnesses of Jesus all the way till nearly the end of the first century. In Matthew chapter 19, after Jesus had been engaging with people, telling them what they must do to obtain eternal life, the disciples, having heard that it was with great difficulty that a man would be saved, and particularly those who had wealth. It says in Matthew 19, 26, and looking upon them, Jesus said, with men, these things are impossible, but with God, all things are possible. And Peter said, well, Lord, behold, we've left everything and followed you. What then will be there for us? In Vietnam, 58,000 men at least lost their lives. If you travel to Washington, D.C. today, you'll see a memorial there with 58,279 names currently inscribed upon it. If you visit Washington, D.C., you'll find over 100 such memorials placed throughout the city as a reminder of the price that was paid for this country to have the freedoms that it now enjoys. During the entire course of the sermon, in a loop over my head will be played verses. Out of these verses, at least 16 of them are quotes of Jesus himself as he spoke about the coming days of fire and trial. And for every one of those verses, most of which are prophetic, speaking of the price that would be paid, I would like for you to imagine the disciples that must have suffered, been persecuted, or died And their last thoughts may very well have been some of those words. This is our memorial in a very real way. As we joined our hearts together in worship in the supper that passed before us just a moment ago, I hope you were praying as I was. Father, thank you for granting unto us the fellowship and the oneness that comes to this bread, this body, and this blood, this cup, because in it we find who we are. In Matthew chapter 20, verses 20 through 23, the mother of the sons of Zebedee came to Jesus with her two sons and bowed down before him and made a request of him. And he said to her, what is it you wish? And she said to him, command that in your kingdom that these two sons of mine may sit, one on your right and one on your left. But Jesus answered and said to her, You don't know what you're asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I am able to drink? And they said to him, we are able. It is an amazing thing to me that they made that bold statement. All one must do is back up in the chapter to realize the context in which this request came. Verse 17. As Jesus was about to go up to Jerusalem, he took the 12 disciples aside by themselves on the way. And he said to them in private, Behold, we are going up to Jerusalem. And the Son of Man will be delivered up to the chief priests and the scribes. And they will condemn him and they will put him to death. And they will deliver him up to the Gentiles to mock and scourge and crucify him. And on the third day, he will be raised up. How do you then request in my kingdom, in your kingdom, Lord, allow us to sit one on your left and one on your right? 
Can you drink the cup of which I drink, Jesus asks? Yes, Lord. Persecution and sacrifice are a very real part of discipleship. In fact, I would argue, based on the verses that are continuing to scroll above my head today, that it is our heritage. It is the seed through which our faith has been born. Just as we can go to Washington and we can gaze upon those memorials and remember the price that was paid and the kind of valor and courage in the hearts of men and women who were willing to die so that we could have a free way of life, you have in your spiritual DNA and in your heritage a bloodline that runs deep. And to the surface in that bloodline comes that look upon your face that has to be there. A reminder of who you are and from whence you come. We have lived in a world of ease for a long, long time. We have had blessings that in my mind have gone so far as to even begin to taint our souls. It was Jeremiah, the great prophet, who spoke on behalf of God and said in Jeremiah twenty two twenty one, 21, I, that is God, spoke to you in your prosperity, but you said, I will not listen. There are moments in history when God decides to wake up the world. This past week, we all lived through a blip, an anomaly, and it nearly crushed many people. I ask you today to consider how this moment in this past week should be challenging in preparing us for whatever it is that is coming. I've been saying from this pulpit to the chagrin of some for over a year now, something is coming. And you can say, well, Mike, we've already had COVID and we've already had an election that seems to have shaped in strange and maybe ungodly ways the next steps in our country toward more lax rules regarding abortion and so many other things. We've already had the worst winter spell in the history of our nation, or of the state anyway. What's next? I don't know. But I do know God is preparing us. There is a I think an attitude among many of the saints that this too shall pass. I hope you aren't angry with me when I say to you, I'm beginning to pray that it doesn't pass. I'm seeing an awakening in people. This last week, I had people who were under enormous stress who have never spoken a word spiritual to me that reached out to me and said, God must be trying to tell us something. You think it's an anomaly what's going on in our world now and how unusual things are and how all of this strife and all of this chaos, that's the anomaly? No, you're wrong. The peace you've lived in for the last 70 years is the anomaly. God's people have always been out of this world. God's people have never been called to live in physical peace, but rather spiritual peace. Until we learn to embrace and use the struggle and the suffering, we will not have an unstoppable church. 
But the moment we finally figure it out as a body, and I'm talking to us right here, the moment we finally figure out that embracing the struggles, the strife, the suffering, embracing it is that which eliminates the last foothold Satan has in our lives. If he can't torture us out of the kingdom, he can't force us out of the kingdom. Acts 5.41, when they had called the disciples for preaching before the Sanhedrin and charged them to speak no more in this name, they scourged them and then they let them go away from the council And the scripture says that they went their way rejoicing that they had been considered worthy to suffer dishonor for the name. There may be some of us called to suffer for being a Christian. That's what Acts 5 is talking about. And then there may be some who are called to suffer as a Christian. No subtle difference, but... Kind of like Job. The story of Job in the opening chapter speaks of a man who had it all. The wealthiest man in the region. Thousands of camels and the herds of sheep and goats and a family that was blessed, sons and daughters and everything a man could ever want. And Satan had been prowling about the earth, chapter 1 says. And there came a day when the sons of God appeared before the Father. And Satan also showed up. And God asked him, where have you been? And Satan said, I've been about the earth. Have you considered my servant Job? There's nobody like Job. He serves me and honors me. And Satan said, well, of course he does. Why wouldn't he? You've built a hedge around him. Everything he does, you bless. Take his possessions and see what happens. You know how the story ends. In one night's fleeting moment, one by one, and before the first can finish his statement, the second comes in, and before the second can finish his statement, the third comes in. And before the conversation is over, Job realizes that as a result of bandits and a result of weather, everything he has is gone. And rather than cursing God in Job 121, the scripture says that Job fell to his knees, tore his garments and said, the Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And even when his friends begin to try to convince him that maybe what he needs to do is curse God and lay down and die, Job says no. Job 13, 15, though he slay me, yet will I trust him. Sometimes the events that unfold in our world are not because we're a Christian specifically, but it's as a Christian that we're called. I know that everyone in this room says, well, if we as Christians are, because we're Christians, forced to suffer or to give up or be persecuted, I can deal with that. But what if it's something eternal? There is nothing in Scripture that suggests that what happened to Job doesn't happen to other people. In fact, it's the opposite. Do you recall that in the very setting we're talking about, Jesus tells Peter, Peter, Satan has demanded permission to sift you like wheat. Maybe what we're enduring and what we're encountering is more than just something in this world where the externals, the people will persecute us. Maybe what's occurring and what will be occurring is more eternal than that. Are you able to drink from the cup of which I drink? He asked this of James and John. You know who they are, right? In Mark 3, Jesus gave them in verse 17 the title, Sons of Thunder, boisterous. They were willing to stand up always. 
Theirs was the voice that said to the Samaritan, to Jesus about the Samaritan village that had rejected him, shall we call down thunder and lightning from heaven and wipe them out? Because Jesus said, you don't even know what kind of spirit you are. Are you able to drink the cup of which I drink? His brother John becomes most likely the longest living apostle, banished, exiled to the Isle of Patmos in the last days of his life where he writes the Revelation. I've often wondered if John, as he was writing the gospel account that he was charged to write, remembered those words. Because in John 18, 11, he said, Shall I not drink the cup the Father has given me? Go to Acts chapter 11. Our study today really focuses on the 11th and 12th chapters. The scripture says in Acts eleven nineteen. so then those who were scattered because of the persecution, by the way, 10 years have passed since the death of Stephen. Many of the chapters in Acts cover a year or two worth of history. The whole purpose of Acts is to give us a context in which to understand the spread of the gospel. And so those that had been scattered because of the persecution arose in connection with Stephen, made their way to Phoenicia and Cyprus and Antioch, speaking the word to no one except Jews only. And there were some of them, men of Cyprus and Cyrene, who came to Antioch and began speaking to the Greeks also, preaching the Lord Jesus. And the hand of the Lord was with them, and a large number believed and turned to the Lord. And news about them reached the ears of the church at Jerusalem, and they sent Barnabas off to Antioch. When then they had come and witnessed the grace of God, they rejoiced in beginning to encourage them all with a resolute heart to remain true to the Lord. See, this Barnabas was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and faith, and considerable numbers were brought to the Lord. And he left for Tarsus to find Saul. And when he had found him, he brought him to Antioch, and it came about that for an entire year they met with the church and taught considerable numbers, and the disciples were first called Christians there in Antioch. And at that time, some prophets came down from Jerusalem, and one of them named Agabus stood up again to indicate by the influence of the Holy Spirit that there would be certainly a great famine all over the world. And this took place in the reign of Claudius. And to the proportion that any of the disciples had means, each of them determined to send a contribution for the relief of the brothers in Judea. And this they did, sending it by the hand of Barnabas and Saul to the elders. And about that time, Herod the king... By the way, this is the Herod uh, down in verse 23 we're going to find who uh, ultimately is eaten of worms and dies, and we'll see that in just a moment. But he decides to lay hands on some of those who belong to the church. Those are your brothers and sisters of whom these verses above my head represent. And he mistreated them, and he had James, the brother of John, ah, arrested and put to death with a sword. He was beheaded. Can you drink from the cup of which I drink, Jesus had asked. Can you drink from the cup of which I drink, Jesus had asked 10 years earlier. Yes, James and John say, we can drink from the cup. We will drink from the cup when the time comes. He has James killed. This Herod is the grandson of Herod the Great. Josephus says that he was a man of great spiritual mindset, but self-serving. He wanted to please the Jews. He devoutly followed the laws. He offered sacrifices. But oh, what a proud man he was. Later in this chapter, down in verse 23, you will find that the reason he's eaten of worms and dies is because when he spoke, the people said, the voice of an angel... But rather than giving glory to God, he took it all in. And because he did not give glory to God, the angel of the Lord smote him and he died. In verse 2 it says, though, that he put James to death with a sword. Verse 3, when he saw that it had pleased the Jews that he'd killed James, he thought, this is great, I'm going to arrest Peter also. And he does. And during the days of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, so this is a seven-day period after Passover, what this means is that Peter spent probably the better part of a week in prison waiting to see what was going to happen. 
And he intended that after all of these Passover and this Feast of Unlimited Bread, after all this had passed, he intended to bring him out before the people. And you know what he was getting ready to do. But the Bible says in verse 5 that Peter in prison, while he was waiting, great fervent prayer was being made by the church of God on Peter's behalf. I want to encourage you today to consider the power of prayer. I even reached out to some of you this morning, specifically by name, and asked you to be in prayer. And I asked you to be in prayer during this, ser- during this service, during this sermon, and I trust you are. I'm a firm believer that the power of pr- prayer transforms hearts, that God listens and hears. And I'm a Convinced that the power of prayer is able to open the heart that has grown cold and callous. I'm convinced that prayer is able to touch the one who has not yet thought deeply enough about God. Ephesians 6.18 says, Pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert. Always keep praying for all the Lord's people. Philippians chapter 4, verses 4 through 8. Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice, but be anxious for nothing. In everything with prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. Be anxious for nothing. And literally in the Greek, that means not even one thing should divide your attention away from your focus on God. Anxiety. Don't fall to pieces. Don't be pulled apart. Don't be divided. Brothers, that's why that fellowship this morning in the cup and the bread was so important. Unites us together. It pulls us into a common purpose. As was so appropriately said, this is the time and in the week when we come together to recharge and to refocus. And Mike was so correct when he said it draws us back into balance. I need it. I don't know about you. I need it today. I have been waiting for this day all week long. And as I've gone through this week, the thing that I've kept thinking is those glorious mysteries of how God works. 1 Corinthians 4 1 speaks of those mysteries. And it's a reminder to me that all of these blessings and answered prayers and enlightenment and peace and power and relational relationship growth, all of these things, they all come back to this mystery of the gospel. If you prayed this past week, you were probably praying to some degree or another and asking us, you know, as you read scripture, this tells us what we have to do in these moments. But let me tell you what the Bible doesn't tell you. It doesn't tell you what God will do. Not everything. God is alive in every moment. And isn't it wonderful to know that in this past week, he's been alive in every one of these moments. God works. Have you ever read Hebrews 5, 7? It says that in the days of his flesh, speaking of Jesus, Jesus offered up prayers and supplication with loud cries and with tears Now listen to the next part of this verse. To him who, he prayed to God, to him who was able to save him from death. And he was heard. But didn't Jesus die? What have you been praying for this past week? Have you been praying that God would not even make you go through the valley of the shadow of death? Is that what you were praying for? Or were you praying for strength as you passed through it? Were you praying that the afflictions would pass, or were you praying for comfort as those afflictions came? Do you see that those afflictions brought you closer to God? That it's good. And so you fed on his statutes and his word. Are you praying that he lets you bypass the afflictions or that he delivers you from the afflictions? Are you praying that persecution would not come or are you praying that righteousness would be exalted, the glorification of God through the persecutions that you suffered? What are you praying for? 
Are you praying, let everyone love me? Or are you praying, let me be hated for the right reason? For your name. Are you praying that there be no cross? Or that he gives you the strength to carry your cross? Are you praying to find your life? God, give it back. Or are you praying, let me learn how to lose it? You're not of the world. So the world would love you. But you're not. Because I chose you out of the world. That's why I'd hate you. And so the peace you have will not be a worldly peace, an earthly peace. It will be a spiritual peace. The brethren prayed for Peter. For seven days, basically. Fervently. And verse 6 says, On the very night when Herod was about to bring him forward to the same fate that James had suffered, Peter, how it is even possible that the next words that I'm about to read are true, was sleeping on the very night Peter was sleeping Herod did not want Peter to get away he arrested him with an entourage of soldiers 16 total four squads verse 4 He puts him in a prison cell with two soldiers, one on either side, with two chains, not just one, and then guards in front of the door on top of that. You ever seen magic acts? Where they box you up and they chain you down? And they put them in a tub of water and they seal the top and put a lock on it. And then they drop a curtain over it. And the next thing you know, the guy appears, voila. Kind of feel that sensation in this moment. How in the world is God going to deliver him out of this? On the very night. God frequently waits till the very night to deliver you. You ever notice that? (laughs) How often does God wait till the absolute last possible moment? How often does he make your deliverance more striking because he seeds the scene with soldiers and chains and guards and prison cells and doors? It makes it impossible that anyone could ever give glory or think they had done it themselves. I think of Sarah almost 100 years old, waiting for the promise of God. And when they finally come, the messengers, and say, you're about to have a child, you remember what it says? She laughed. (laughs) Now? Really? Now? You made me suffer all these years? Could have been her language. What about Daniel? There is not one word in Scripture that suggests that Daniel had any clue what the end result was going to be when they opened the door to that pit and threw him down in that lion's den. Do you suppose that as his body was making the drop from the ceiling, it was probably a pit, down to the floor, that he had, he had just as many questions as you would have had if you'd been the one getting dropped? What about Lazarus? The sisters are praying, Lord, send, please come. They send for him. If you'd only been here, they'll later say, he wouldn't have died. How is this? God waits so often till the very night. The angel shows up in that room, verse 7, suddenly, and a light shone in the cell, and he struck Peter's side and roused him, my translation says, and said, get up. And the chains fell off his hands. Gird yourself, put your sandals on, 
And he did so. Wrap your cloak around you and follow me. And he went out and continued to follow. But he didn't know what was being done by the angel was real. He thought maybe he was just having a vision. They passed the first guard, then the second guard. They came to the iron gate, and it was open just by itself. And they went out along one street, and immediately the angel departed. And Peter kind of came to himself and realized, oh, my goodness, this is real. The Lord's angel has been sent forth and rescued me from the hands of Herod and from all the Jewish people. And when he realized this, he went to the house of Mary, the mother of John, who was called Mark. And many people were gathered there together praying for him. It's in the middle of the night, and they're still praying. There's your 24-hour prayer, prayer chain. They knocked at the, he knocked at the door of the gate, and the servant girl named Rhoda came to answer. She saw it was Peter's voice or heard it, and she was so joyful she, did, she forgot to open the gate. She runs back in and tells all the people that Peter's outside, and they said to her, you're crazy. But she kept insisting it was so, and they kept saying, no, it's just got to be his angel. Herod must have gone ahead and killed him. But Peter continued knocking. And when they opened, they saw him, and they were amazed. And he said, shh, be quiet, be quiet. And he described everything that the Lord had done, how he'd let him out of the prison. And he said, go tell James. That's not the James who was beheaded. That's probably the brother, half-brother of Jesus who wrote the, God, the book of James. And he departed and went to another place. Man, isn't it incredible, the heroes of the New Testament? You know what's more incredible to me? Are you aware of the fact that this is virtually the last time you hear about Peter in the book of Acts? Drops off. Oh, I know you see him at the council of Jerusalem in Acts 15 when it just says he's there and he has some comments, but this is it. Everything up to this point has focused around Peter and his work and sharing the gospel to the Jews and all that magnificent work. And then all of a sudden, stops. Just gone. Hardly ever heard of again. Oh, how little the Bible and the book of Acts cares about its heroes. <laughs> Peter, so what? From chapter 13 forward, you'll notice, and while they were ministering to the Lord, verse 2, and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul, that's Paul, because there is work that I have called them to do. The whole rest of the book of Acts now focuses on the gospel bursting forth into the Gentile world. I said how little, isn't it amazing how little the book of Acts cares about its heroes? Maybe I should have said it differently. The book of Acts has only one hero, only one name that it celebrates. And that's the name of the Lord Jesus Christ to whom Peter ascribed his deliverance that night and of whom he himself once said, there is salvation in no one else. There is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Acts 4.12. You see, the book of Acts isn't about Peter. It isn't about Paul. It isn't about Barnabas. It isn't about Mary or John Mark. They are all just participants in the grand story of the, listen, of the life of Jesus Christ. Christ, because when you finally submerge everything that you have, everything that you own, everything that you are, every dream that you possess into his name, you identify only and solely with him, and nothing else matters. And since he wins, we win. So is Peter in the rest of the book of Acts? Yes. Yes. He's there in the story of Jesus Christ. Now, let's bring this all back around and I have to stop. I don't know what last week was, but I think it was a warning shot across the bow. Um, Patrick, you pointed out in your prayer that this last week what God really did is he shook us 
in things we thought were foundational in our lives. Uh, we need that every once in a while because it reminds us that I don't care who you are or what you have, it's that, that fast that all of a sudden we are down trying to figure out a way to scramble and melt, melt snow to make water to survive. And I don't care what you think you got, you're not ready for what God can bring on unless you are fully invested in him. So I want us to be thinking prayerfully this next couple of weeks about what this congregation needs to do to be ready for the next crisis because one is coming and how we are going to use it as an opportunity to reach the lost. That's why these moments come. That's why suffering comes. That's why persecution comes. That's why affliction comes. So as we share abundantly in Christ's sufferings, let's share also in this great comfort that we are afflicted in every way but not crushed, perplexed but not driven to despair, persecuted but not forsaken, struck down but not destroyed, always carrying around in our body the death of Christ so that Christ may be alive in our mortal bodies. Amen. For our final